The funding for this video is provided by the amazing members of my Patreon. Also contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Yeah, I started from PBS Kids. What you gonna do? Fight me? Anyway, throw the video. Like, nah, hear me out. Sam Levinson, he's just American Thomas Ashtruck. Thomas Ashtruck is basically French Sam Levinson. It's Harriana back with another video. Hi, hello, how are you guys doing? My name is Harriana and welcome to or welcome back to the Pirate Ship, also known as Harry Hook's Pirate Ship. I am the captain. You are not my first day. I don't got no first mate because you want to know why. Come here, come here. Nobody's worthy of being the first mate, but hi, hello, how are you guys doing? My name is Harriana and I like to make content based off nostalgia and family children's entertainment and all the issues that I find within those spaces. Now, today we are taking it back. We're gonna do a nice, you know, video where I just get out here and just talk my shit like I just love to do, like I always do. That's why I have a YouTube channel. I just wanna speak and say what's on my mind. Now, this piece right here, this was something that I been wanting to make but I just kind of like took a break from it but no like it literally like just crossed my mind again today and I was like I'm gonna talk about it I'm gonna talk about it by the way this video is going to be a written article on my website if you guys would like to read that harryonahook.com I will have the link to it down below I have started to put blog posts on my website simply because I understand that um YouTube isn't really accessible for a lot of people as they need to have captions and be able to read what is being said so they can take in the information. And while I do have trouble with, you know, putting captions together, just rewriting and rewording the video into an article is just much better for me. And because of that, I just, you know, I want y'all to, yeah, read, but here we go. Uh, if you see me looking down a lot, it's because I'm kind of like looking directly like across her it, but I'm not going to be reading directly from the article I wrote. But it's like, I saw this tweet that went around the lines of Miraculous Ladybug is like the kids show equivalent of Euphoria. And while the shows are completely fucking different, I saw the parallels and I understood why this person said that shit because it is true. And so much of that has to do with both of these shows trend for the wrong reasons. Both of these shows trend because they have awful ass, terrible ass writing. Like the atmosphere of both of these series is completely different. One takes place in the suburb in California. The other one takes place in literally fucking Paris, France. One of the most major cities in the world. Not a major city in France, a major city in the world. All right. And then also one is rated TV Y7, now rated G. The other one's literally rated TV MA. It's just like, what, what the fuck can these two things have in common? But, um, bad writing. Yeah. Now, for those of you guys who need names with these faces, Sam Levison is the creator of HB. HB, so I was about to say HBCU. Wrong, 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 wrong. He's the creator of HBO's Euphoria. And Thomas Ashtruck is the creator of Zag Tunes Miraculous Ladybug. But a lot of people are unaware of what actually owns Miraculous Ladybug because it's distributed in different countries. But Zag is the owner. Now, I'm aware that when it comes to Miraculous Ladybug, there is more than one writer on this series. But Thomas is the only writer on this show that be loud as fuck. And what I mean by that is that anytime somebody points out something off about the writing or something was just completely inaccurate, he gets in like defense mode and starts going off on these people trying to prove them wrong about why this was actually a good decision and this and that and the third. And the funny thing about this is that like, I understand there's numerous people that write for Miraculous Ladybug, but Thomas makes it really obvious which sections are the ones that he wrote. Because if you get really defensive over that, oh, we know there's some history there, sir, okay? Really, 
Thomas, in my opinion, he just makes all of this look worse on himself because, yeah, we can blame Miraculous Ladybug for having black bad writing, but instead of us just, you know, actually pointing out that he was a big problem on his writer's team, he could have just shut up and just let us say all of them couldn't write. Like, that literally would have just saved his, like, embarrassment because every time you go somewhere on the internet, people are talking about how Thomas Astro always getting into it with fans of the show because he he don't know how to be quiet like it's honestly irritating jeremy and jeremy um the producer from reckless ladybug um they both the same side of the the coin i'd rather talk to jeremy because at least jeremy be professional thomas just got this real unprofessionalism to him to the point where it's just like instead of you getting angry at people talking about the writing is bad um uh, maybe you might want to you know sit down and take a look at that and actually learn from your mistake because i'm in college okay one thing about college is that constructive criticism is something that you're going to fucking learn okay literally every single day every single class i'm at every single project you know i was a theater kid too i was constantly being told hey this is bad you need to fix this this is what you can do this and that and the third and i understand that like at the end of the day none of these people that be talking about the bad writing a lot none of these people have uh tv shows and whatever the fuck but because it's like an ongoing issue from the audience reception of them talking about thomas's bad writing he doesn't respond the best to it and i understand that because i for one don't want to be told by someone that's not a creative what the fuck to do on my work like hey you're not a writer you're not gonna tell me how to write but then also you kind of have to look at the overall of what the audience is saying and be like okay i see where there is some work here because it's an overall thing like I literally talked to my filmmaker friends in this and then the third and it was one particular episode in the progenies where they were like hey I'm having a bit of a hard time telling who is who in this scene and I was like thank you for letting me know I need to make sure I do better when it comes to establishing characters names and whatnot okay like that that's taking constructive criticism now with Moving on from Thomas and into Sam, Sam doesn't really have much of a social media presence. Like I remember when his Instagram used to be public, but now it's private. Sam don't talk. He don't talk to the fans. He, he don't fucking talk. He keep that mouth zipped. He keeps it closed, okay? But that, that that's not getting him off the hook because uh, we can literally look up every single episode of euphoria and we see that he is the only writer for all of them with the exception of one and when i found out that that one episode that he had help with when it came to writing hunter scaffner she helped him and everybody said that was some of the best writing within this series what that tell you what that what that tell you okay moving on next one thing that irritates me about these two men's writing has to do with the fact that one we can tell when you wrote it like everybody was like oh sam levinson is the only person writing for the show yeah we can tell one person is doing this oh thomas um made it clear that he added that aspect in there yeah we can tell because he went off on everybody about it i didn't like it okay but Ashtruck and levinson frequently bring in interesting aspects to their show and then they're mostly forgotten in the long run because one ongoing thing i just get on my damn nerves about miraculous ladybug is that one of the first things we learn about marinette dupan chain but we are introduced to her character in this series is that she wants to be a fashion designer she wants to make clothes she wants to make jewelry fashion is her passion she has the passion for fashion she's literally a brat doll okay that's one thing about the series that i really enjoy and part of her fashion inspiration has to do with gabriel Agress, the show's main villain now please tell me um it would it would be nice to see more of Marinette's pieces. Like, I'm not even joking. It would literally be much nicer if we got to see more of her pieces. Because Marinette's fashion designer journey is something that the show often struggles with. And when I say it's struggling, they don't know how to put it in the plot and make it go somewhere and make it progress. Because it's often brought in and out, in and out, in and out. And I understand that marinette's main duty is to be ladybug her main duty is to protect the series but it's like the more we move to her being a superhero the more we stray away from her you know her 
life outside of that with her being a fashion designer and all the other things that she likes to do as well and I also just kind of blame the shift in tone that this series has because in season one it was just very filler very episodic so we did get to see more of Marinette and her designs and this and that and the third but then as the show goes on her designing becomes less important like I'm, I'm gonna tell you season four like bad enough that we barely see marinette design in seasons one through three we don't really see much of it but at least it's there season four we only see her design one time and that was probably only like a two or three minute aspect of the episode it wasn't very long season four had 26 episodes we see Marinette bake fucking macarons and cookies with her parents. We see her helping her parents with their business more than we see her doing any fashion shit. Like, you say, ooh, ooh fashion? Like, y'all know that song from Bretts? It's not ooh, ooh, fashion for me. With Marinette's fashion designing, it's a problem because it's something that we are introduced to her in the show with. This is what one of the first things we learn about her. But as the series progresses on, they stray further and further away from that. To the point where it was only brought up one time out of 26 episodes. And y'all, and, and the thing about it is that season two went, was airing for like two damn years. Okay, next we gotta talk about that little band in the show um, named Kitty Section. Kitty Section had one major episode. And then it was kind of like never brought up to be important again. This is an issue because we see the band quite often and we literally see them like book one gig. I don't care what nobody say. I don't give a fuck what none of y'all say. But doing shows for your friends. I don't care what nobody say. I don't care what nobody say. Doing shows for your friends is not a gig. It is not a gig. It is not a show. You are doing something for your friend. I'm sorry. It's not a show. There don't be nobody out here looking at them to do their music and all that shit on that damn boat. It's annoying because when we find out about Kitty Section, we find out that they're trying to do what they can to get their music pushed out there. But they don't really, we're not seeing the effort. We're not seeing that they actually want to do more with their damn band. Like, y'all literally have Adrian in the band. Adrian could probably help y'all get more people to, you know, you know, get people, go to shows, do gigs. Off that. Oh my God, the kitty section mess just makes me so mad because it's one of my favorite parts of the show. And it's just executed so damn poorly. Like, it's just frustrating because we see that they care about their music and they want more people to hear and they want to get it out and whatever the fuck. But why are we not seeing the effort put there? We see them play all the time, barely, because they cut it short. But I'm like, where's the shows? Where's the audience? Because them little five friends that try to be following from class to be your audience, that's not a gig. <laughs> like, I'm just annoyed because I'm, and don't nobody even try to say anything talking about, well, they did get their song stolen the first time, but I was like, yeah, but at the end of the day, they were able to perform that on live TV because Bob Roth bitch ass, they was about to rat his ass out. So they got them played on TV. That performance right there should have gotten more fans for them, but they actually could have did a, sh a job. Like, it's, ooh. So that's like another thing that irritated me with Miraculous Ladybug is that in that damn New York special, Paris got fucked. Like y'all know how Paris gets fucked up in every episode of this show. But after Paris gets fucked up because of, you know, the superhero shit and all of that, it goes back to normal because of magic. They were all the way in a different freaking country. They was across the world. They was in New York City when Paris ended up getting demolished. And they only went off about it for like two minutes out of that episode. And then next thing you know, when Paris is brought back up in the show, it's talked about how everything is back to normal and it's all sunshine and rainbows and whatever the fuck. Like they acted like a major city being in shambles. This, I'm telling y'all, the city was fucked up. Like it was on national news that the city got fucked. They they just acted like it was nothing and it made no sense because I'm like if the city got fucked and nobody and the superheroes weren't there to you know protect them. One, why are the citizens in Paris not mad at Lady Blue and Cat Noir, first of all? Two, why didn't y'all try to investigate who caused this this this? Who wait? Why are y'all not trying to investigate who is doing this? And that's one annoying thing about Miraculous Ladybug because so much of the writing makes the characters so amazingly stupid to the point where it's frustrating i don't like with the writing of the show they just make everyone so stupid that's something else i gotta say about um euphoria too we gonna get there we gonna get to that girl next but 
so much shit doesn't make sense because they're like, yeah, Okuma attacks are coming, this and that, but I rarely ever see nobody trying to do any kind of investigation on it. Like, we see Clara, like, reporting on the news. Clara and Nadia be reporting on the shit when there is, like, you know, Okuma attack going on and whatever. Alia seems to be, Alia, literally a 15 year old girl, Alia seems to be the only person that seems to try to care to try to get to the bottom of this and try to figure out who is causing this fuckery. Like no magic was used to fix Paris in the special and the atmosphere of the nature just acted as if what happened was no big deal. Like Paris is one of the world's most major companies and they acted as if it getting demolished was like a false alarm. I don't care what nobody said. I remember when there was um, a lot going on here two summers ago here in Atlanta. The CNN Center. A lot of people know the CNN Center, okay? It's one of like Atlanta's like major trademarks. The sign literally got fucking destroyed and it was like world news. And they they just brushed it off like it was nothing like they were like oh paris is gonna be good again oh it's okay that ladybug and catamaran were here everything's back to normal this and that third and i'm just like what the new york special honestly got me some of the worst writing that i have seen in this show and so much of it has to do with the characters just making very stupid decisions to the point where nothing was making sense now we gotta get into a little miss euphoria y'all remember in season one when jules and nate liked each other and then, you know, Nate was, yeah, yeah. Why was that? That shit was not brought up until one time. And it was literally the episode before the season two finale where it was brought up. And it was awkward as fuck. It was a very awkward interaction. I understand that because their relationship was just, Nate don't deserve Jules. Nate is terrible to her. He don't deserve her, okay? But the entire nature of it just felt very fucking off. Because I'm like, first of all, we ain't seen you two interact with each other at all this season. And then it just comes out of nowhere with a very stiff ass scene in a car. Like, that's literally, I was like, is this the end of Nate and Jules? What? No. Like, you literally cannot go seven episodes without mentioning this shit. And mind you that all these euphoria episodes are an hour fucking long. And then it come out of nowhere and the scene lasts like three fucking minutes. Huh? No, there's a character in season one named Daniel that's like recurring because like he interacts with like a few of the main, like many of the main characters actually. Um, Daniel is not brought up again in season two. Like, it's as if Daniel don't exist. Like, and I don't care what nobody said talking about Daniel was a recurring character. This and that. I'm like, no, nah, Daniel was pretty somewhat important to that damn plot. So, where'd he go? And one thing, y'all already know what I'm bringing up. Rue oh that lady 10k I don't care what nobody fucking say I don't like how they try to rap it's Joanna Jordana I always mispronounce her name she made a good a lot of these euphoria points that I'm bringing up are coming from her video I'm gonna link that down below for y'all to watch because it was amazing but no like that entire shit where they tried to have Faye come in there and lie and say Lori did and was trying to get the feds to go after her that was just so out of the ass and that was so very you know, bad writing because I was like, no, how are you going to bring something in that major only for this girl to come in here and be like, oh, it's Lori fault. Y'all gotta just go out to her. Like, no, it don't work that way because 10K, that's what it lay um, you know, yearly college tuition for me and plenty other college students. I know damn well I'm going to be on somebody's ass if they, oh, they took 10K from me. I will literally be pissed. All right. It just felt very lazy. Like, no, I'm not buying this shit. I understand this is supposed to be a fantasy world, but no, this is a show that relies heavily on realism. <laughs> be real. Also, another thing that uh, ha uh, Cassie is a talented ice skater. <laughs> not brought up again in season two. Uh -uh. Also, Kat was a cam girl, which is a storyline in the show I actually really, really fucking despise. I, I hate Kat's cam girl storyline. That was like one of our major plot points in season one. It's only brought up one time in season two. And one, it wasn't even her. It was the girl that was playing her in that play. And two, she was just wearing lingerie and shaking ass. Like, it... it huh? This show, the season two's cat is just terrible. Like, she's non-existent. You literally can write her out and much of anything wouldn't change. And also, one of the biggest complaints I have seen about Euphoria's writing when it came to, like, inconsistency, there was no fucking signs of... Nate and Cassie getting together, okay? Up until season two when they met at the corner store and all of that. 
it that just felt like shock value that was used to progress the plot and i'm just so tired of shock value y'all it's annoying it's frustrating i feel like it's a cheap way to progress stories now i just don't like shock value it's just really frustrating like them fucking in the bathroom that literally was just okay well then that just the the decline of both of their characters because it made no sense why that happened because cassie and nate never showed any kind of interest in each other now i also gotta get into you know the uh, <laughs> the, the, the um we also gotta get into the social issues aspect of their terrible writing sam and thomas they do not do well when it comes to writing girls and people of color especially girls of color it's honestly beyond awful like i'm gonna read real for real right here but they were like heavily on racial stereotypes for their non-white characters and with levinson with the exception of one main character of color which is rue most of the non-white characters are sidelined or heavily stereotyped all right gia gia's ad barely showed up in season two okay she was only there for like two episodes and boom bye like we we don't see gia okay barely she's barely there okay and all she did was fight with her sister i'm just like okay fine maddie is literally the walking stereotype of the spicy latina trail by the way like i said just watch joanna's video jordana i gotta learn how to pronounce her name correctly her video will be down below she goes way more into detail about why maddie's character is a big problem now mckay's character is just terribly written in my opinion because most of his arc is just him being treated like shit by white people and trying to appeal to that white gaze and um uh they just kind of throw all that away he appears one time in season one in not season one season two at the party scene never seen again you know what good for you algae get off this show when you can <laughs> now we gotta bring up this bobby bobby is i was really happy when i saw her because i was like we're finally getting a dark-skinned black girl on this show and while bobby is the darkest character on this show she is one of the recurring characters that got the least amount of attention and the least amount of screen time she even got like the least amount of lines her only purpose in this show was to help out her white friend lexi howard with her play and then you know when lexi ended up having a breakdown Bobby was the one that was there to comfort her. I was just like, okay, uh, I understand that this is Bobby's job to be the stage manager, but that was just like her only, her only purpose in this show was just to serve Lexi, and that's it. She didn't do much of anything. She barely said anything, and it's sad because Veronica Taylor is a very beautiful woman. She has such a nice voice. I wanted to see more of her. Now we gotta get into the race issues with Miraculous Ladybug that I have talked about numerous times on this damn channel. But Ali Sasser literally talks in a black scent. Literally, she's she's heavily stereotyped. I don't care what nobody says. And she does talk in slang from time to time. And it's frustrating because Alia is neither one played by a black woman. She's not. Go look it up. And two, uh, she's not written by a black woman either. So yeah, that's that. And Alia also falls into that magical Negro stereotype where so many black characters are often put into media for the sake of serving their non-white friends. And Alia's only purpose within this series is to be Marinette's token black friend. She acts as if she's a mammy to her. She literally is there to her. She puts her problems second for the sake of being Marinette's friend and doing everything she needs to do and be to her assistant and mind you that Marinette is a very white passing biracial Chinese girl okay like Marinette favors her white side more than she favors her Asian side so it's it's just all the more frustrating and Marinette's character also is just kind of written not too well either because it's just so many it's just kind of like when it comes to Marinette's character it's obvious that this team doesn't really do much of their research when it comes to Asian heritage and how they're different in different countries because China and Japan are two completely different countries there's going to be different cultures over there but they're both of Asia so there are going to be some similarities that overlap Marinette's character it I real they should have just done more of their fucking research with her or actually get a Chinese woman to write her that that just make that's it and literally Alia's boyfriend Nino Lahif he is literally like Nino literally is like 
the boy version of Alia. They went on a mirror each other. They're literally the same character. They both talk in black scent, that heavy ass slang. And, but Nino is now voiced by a black voice actor, the also talented Zeno Robinson. But also, Nino's only purpose in this show, other than, you know, being in Alia, and we don't really get to see them being coupley all that much until season four is that and then oblivio where they got akumatized because they wanted to go be all coupley and shit like we don't really get to see much of that little interaction right there and also nino's main focus in this story is just to serve adrian who is white oh it's an inspiring filmmaker i understand that like you're not going to be perfect at everything you're not going to be great at everything good things take time and also good things often involve the help of somebody else I know my strengths and my weaknesses when it comes to writing. So one, you're either gonna learn how to do it better or two, ask for help. And that goes hand in hand because oftentimes if you want to learn how to do better at somebody, you better at somebody, now better at something, you gotta go ask somebody that can do that thing to help you with it, okay? There's nothing wrong with asking for help, okay? Because when miraculous ladybug is good, it's good. But when it's bad, it's bad. When euphoria is good, it's good. But when it is bad, it is almost comical. Like, both of these shows be comically bad at time to times where you're just sitting here and being like, that really happened, that really did that. Like, that entire scene of Cassie just dancing around in her um, swimsuit and drinking wine and getting stuck in the balloons. I'm like, for what? What, what was the point of adding that in there? That literally added nothing to this show. It added nothing to the value, okay? Like, I understand struggling when it comes to writing certain things, but there there's numerous people in this world. I understand the thing about trust issues because I don't be trusting certain people with my work and don't be trust, uh, asking them to help write and all that. I've had a situation like that before in the past with a short film. It was bad, irritating, but I'm just like, y'all both? can benefit Sam and Thomas y'all both can benefit if you actually have other people come in to help you with these things like Sam please bring in some women of color to help you write you you desperately need it Thomas Jeremy mainly y'all need to bring in some women of color to help y'all with this show okay I've heard that they did add some women but I'm I'm unsure of what their races are anyway we we're making some kind of progress with Reckless Lady Blood we'll see but Sam season three coming up if you want people to keep treating y'all show like it's a fucking joke you gotta do something about that writing room baby but thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I had a lot of fun making it. It's been a while since I just kind of made a video that wasn't extremely like heavily edited and all that. It's just me coming on camera just to talk and express like my feelings and whatever the fuck okay i know a lot of people don't be liking it when i make videos like this but trust me y'all i got some longer form content coming out that is you know video picture all of that okay i got y'all i got y'all i got y'all but that's pretty much all i wanted to say for this video if you guys like to support me check out my website my writing is on there and also merch is there please check that out i have buy me a coffee i have Kofi and patreon donation links will be down below another thing um uh, we have a gofundme campaign going on right now for my web series called the progenies please support that if you can please support black women in film because that's what you're doing when you donate eh? and if you want to know another way you can support me is just to follow me on everything at harry Ariana, H A R I Y A N A. Thank you guys so much for watching and have a good night. Will just blow your mind. Buttercup, I feel in three at a time. Bubbles will smile while kicking your butt and bouncing will leap them out of their rut. Cherish and power puff, two of a kind. Both wanna save the world before bad times. From Townsville, Memphis, New York to LA. The power puff girls are just here to say.